Okay, I'm walking to my car or my van. This is Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> People are wearing masks even outside, um, except if like nobody's around. Kind of noticed that trend. So if I pause for a second to put it on, that's why. Just trying to be respectful and aware of what others around me are doing out of kindness. Um, I think maybe it was a little bit of a weird choice to choose to see Boulder for the first and maybe only time without um, anything really being open. So I'm like seeing the land without really feeling the lands people but I feel like that was actually the perfect choice for COVID because when I was in Fort Collins last night um, there were a lot of people around and nobody getting super close but still it's you know and all the businesses were socially distancing but it was still you know I don't know <laughs> I love the rainbows it's pretty great this town I can tell has very high ideals I just watched a man um, chatting with a homeless woman. She was sitting inside a little nook at a building and I heard him say something about, oh yeah, I've, I've ruined some rings before. Like, I think something like, you know, maybe she lost her ring or broke a ring or something. And, I don't know, he was just kind of crouching down and just chatting with her like a person. And that's not one of my gifts necessarily because of trauma and picking up energy but I've noticed there are some people in the world who can like foster a ton of children and go volunteer and be around tons of people even if those people have mental illness that causes them to be aggressive or violent so I'm very grateful for different types of people in the world I tend to live life through a sort of safety lens which now I guess is virtual everything <laughs> YouTube and hi squirrel YouTubing and writing songs and sharing on Instagram and I even have lost a little bit of a drive to book tours I mean obviously with COVID but book tours or even book shows like even a single show because the amount of anxiety that I feel for that whole day of like gearing everything up it's like then that's what the day is focused on and then there's the show and then if the show doesn't go well then there's that feeling but even if the show goes very well and you sell some shirts and you meet some people it's kind of like the difference between being a hermit and writing books or meditating on a mountaintop or being like an urban socialite and like going to parties every night like I'm not saying shows are parties but I think it it lives in a similar place in me and to sorry that was just because my hand was tired <laughs> to have so I had so much interest in being in doing shows to connect with more and more and more people but if I'm honest you have to look at the whole picture when you make decisions and I think say I would meet five people at a show but say it derails my energy for like a week or even two weeks in terms of the intensity of preparing for that show Or just the overwhelm of feeling nervous about what people will think of me or what I'll think of me. And then say that derails or alters what other things I would have done with that time, including working on albums. So I'm trying to look at things honestly and, and trust all the spiritual books that I've read of so many different topics like if you pray about something or you meditate about something and it doesn't feel right or guided for you then it doesn't matter what your logic or even your intuition tells you like my intuition might tell me that playing shows is important if I wanted to be on this path 
then all these other components may tell me that shows, or at least not very many shows, um, shows are not for me. And that's hard. It's hard to walk past a poster in Boulder saying 60 musicians, are you tired of Zooming? 60 musicians and all these things are going to be at this outdoor thing and, and to not feel this feeling that I used to feel when I was 20 before I started playing shows. This feeling of like, what about me? What about me? I'm good too. I, I write songs. I used to see shows when I was in high school. I saw basement grungy shows at these like epic rave type things and me and my friend Michelle, we went out and it was like, I wanted to be part of that world and I wasn't. I was a band kid. I was a play flute first chair. I was in theater company writing sketch comedy and you know, I was like what some people probably thought was a nerd, but like I was loving my life being artsy. And then it just was confusing that to get out into the world that that doesn't translate to these like bands and divey venues thing that was going on the whole time. My friend, uh, well, he was my first boyfriend, actually, Justin Smith. He's a violinist in New York City, actually, now. Um, but we always played music together coming up. and um, But he did try to have me be in his band when we were in high school. And he invited me, and I shared one of my songs, and we all played it as a band. But the lead singer that was of that band, I won't say his name, but he didn't like it. And, and Justin even explained it to me later. Like, I think he's just, like, threatened by you. There's like no guy in my life who talked to me the way that Justin talked to me. Like he was really kind to me. And we met up again and hung out when I was living in New York, which was right when he moved out there. So hi Justin, you're a wonderful person and you're an example of what a nice guy was like. I didn't choose nice guys my whole life until my now boyfriend, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being nice and helping me. He tried to help me be in a band, but I'm pretty feisty and I'm pretty bossy, but like, I don't think I'm bossy. I take that back. I'm opinionated. And so, and I talk a lot, like obviously. So like, if I was in a practice and I really had an opinion, like something could be better, then I would give it a lot of words to try to not say it in a mean way, but I'm sure it was still obvious what I thought or felt. So that's not great, <laughs> like for other people, to know that I'm like a conservatory trained musician now. But even back then, I was winning like Chopin competitions, and I probably did intimidate people with my skills and how easily I could play through all the chord progressions in all the keys. And so things that were a struggle or something that needed work for other people aren't a struggle and don't need work for me. There's tons of other things that do need work for me, but those aren't the things. And so being in a band for me, I probably come off as impatient or I probably come off like things are easy like just hurry up and get it I don't mean to and I and I've tried to mitigate that like in Cloudlight, I pulled that way back because I know that those guys make me sound better <laughs> like they add a really cool a really cool vibe to anything I write and plus uh, it's a joy to like add parts to anything Brian writes and and then Mackenzie is just like Sparkle King and he'll just add anything. And Saya was great to have as a drummer. Um, they're not our drummer anymore. And who knows where Cloudlight will continue to unfold to. Right now it's uh, just me and Brian and Mac and moving slowly, but there's Cloudlight magnets all over my tour van. I'll show you that. You can see it down the aisle. There. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep walking. Um, so, um, let's go this way. This woman had a really cute rainbow shirt on. There's a bohemian beer garden over there. Okay. So, um, chocolate factory. I wonder if that's like a college. I don't even know. I'll show you what I'm seeing. Hmm. So. Oh, it's the courthouse. Wild. There's a Black Lives Matter sign out front. I'll walk over there. 
I'm not sure where to make my second song here. Um, but just lots of good vibes. Very mellow vibes. I think some of that is adjusting to the um, altitude. Which I enjoy. It makes me feel um, a little stronger. So this is Pearl Street, I think it was called. I just kind of Googled something about Boulder. Figured this was the most iconic area of Boulder, whether or not this is actually where the locals go. I just figured, well, just trying to feel the space and the place. It's really interesting to see so many people who look like they maybe live on the streets and kind of see it in a soft way. Um, because one of the things that bothered me a little when I first drove in was just seeing some houses, really small houses, right by the start. All oh, that old movie theater. And knowing that those really small houses were probably like $400,000, and that just really bothered me. And I know that price comes from demand, and I know that it's because there's not a lot of neighboring communities right nearby. And so if people want to live somewhere and the price goes up because the demand goes up, it's like... I understand how that happens, but yeah, it's just a little sad because it's a really cool place, but not very affordable, at least not for me. Let's see if that's a view. one. Super green. Okay, last song. I'm repping my boyfriend's mother's popcorn shop. <laughs> Proudly from Edinburgh or Edinburgh. I don't know if it's the American pronunciation of Edinburgh. Indiana. Southern Indiana where I wrote one of my favorite songs I've written recently. Hi Heather. Hi Pat. Settle down and 
find the time to refine some things like where my wings got broken so long ago. And I'll finally know you I'll find it for you Where I wanted to Finally know you <laughs> Yeah With my fear out to be seen and looked at like a puzzle or a bird flying fast, wanting to be heard, but I'm not listening to you anymore, or at least I'm not honoring At least I'm not letting you drive the car. At least not too far. <laughs> well, apparently I write songs that I really like in Boulder. That's wild. So, so far my top two places lately to write songs are Boulder, Colorado and Edinburgh, Indiana. <laughs> and Michigan. Love you, Michigan. I write a lot of songs that I really love at our house. Um, or at least, hmm, maybe I don't lately, but only because I think I just did so many there with challenges and making everything into a challenge and into a source of ambition. I think, you know, working on albums there, it's just, I guess I haven't written songs that I really, really love there in a little while. Ah, that's actually not true. On my piano. And then there's benches all around Grand Haven where I write songs that I really like. But the air being thinner here, it feels like I can differently, if that makes sense. I'm one of those people that accidentally cares so specifically that if you pause for every request that comes your way, like I used to, okay, let me explain. I would have like 20 minute long or hour long email type replies or messages with fans because I if someone liked me and expressed it, I didn't know how to just say like, thank you so much and just receive it. And so I would reply back and it would turn into more like a friendship. And so for a long time, I was unable to have fans because I didn't know how to be in that imbalance. I always wanted to give the most <laughs> time or energy and that is not sustainable. And I equate a lot of things to um, energy and also to like the elements and I don't even mean to I just think it's true and maybe there's a reason why nuns live on mountaintops because it's hard to care and to keep growing your heart and then you know I don't know I don't think one way is better than the other that's the other thing I've seen some incredible people help other incredible people and their lives get very focused because if you live in a place that's so moist and damp <laughs> like it it's lush everything grows easily and constantly and things grow inside of me and in my case I've grown so many starts of projects that I don't even know where to go where to grow 
because Michigan, with all of its moisture in the air and all of its fertile everything, feels like almost tropical. It's hard to, for me, it's hard to then prune the things that are growing, like our bushes in the front of our house. It's hard for me to want to cut back anything that grew even if it means we look like the crazy people on the block because our bushes, one's even a mulberry tree, are like growing so wildly out of control that they block both our windows in the front, you know? But that's what growth, that's what constant growth makes me feel. It makes me feel like wrong. Like, not wrong like bad. It just makes me feel so, so, so alive, but I don't know how to tame it. So Michigan is like a phenomenal place, maybe for people who are born there and know how to work with that kind of energy. Um, but I was born somewhere more dried out <laughs> energetically so <laughs> it's a weird it's a weird uh... <laughs> sorry a weird little challenge to uh, to figure that out speaking of I'm back at my van spill my coffee. Hold on, just getting out my keys. Well, that was a weird adventure. I didn't really mean to walk all around Boulder while YouTubing. Oh, here's the book I got that I was mentioning. I think that was in the previous video. Um, yeah. It's hard to know. Colorado is expensive, but I don't want to just assume that just because I don't know how a path would unfold, that that means it for sure won't unfold, you know? And I told um, my boyfriend years ago that I want to be within a half day's drive of someone in my family. And so he's known that ever since pretty much we started dating. And then it just sucks that my sister moved out to Colorado a couple years ago, so that kind of puts the pressure on moving much further than maybe I originally meant. Um, I might have meant like back to Chicago, where I used to live, or something, but... No, I guess I used to be a half day to drive from my sister. She lived in Racine, where we grew up. So. so maybe it wasn't just about that originally. I just knew I was supposed to go somewhere other than Michigan eventually. Um, and I'm not always trying to talk about trauma, but it's probably partly that. I went there for very challenging reasons. So I dropped my ex off and meant to then leave and go explore where I belong. And I, I think I could live there my whole life in terms of it's not like he owns the place. But I've just had this feeling of calling for a really long time that that eventually I would be moving somewhere else, so. Anyway, maybe I have an abundance. If you study things like uh, Vedic, Vedic, uh, whatever, maybe I have an abundance of one of the three energies. There's like the one that's like five, Pitta, Vata, and ka, Kapha, Kappa. Anyway, you can look it up if you want, but I think my system, like, even though the air feels dry in my nose, my system feels better here in terms of, like, I feel more like myself. Maybe that's the Rocky Mountain High. I'm not even up in the mountains yet. But, like, it's... I feel more like I can sense my own self rather than, you know, the man meditating to my left, like, by 20 feet. Like, I can't sense him here in the same way. Like, I can understand him with my mind and I can feel compassion for him in my heart. Um... But in Michigan, at least where I lived in Michigan, in West Michigan, it was almost like I felt like the place was haunted, but I think that word is mean. It's more just that I could feel things that weren't mine all the time. Like I would be in a perfectly good mood and then I would go stand somewhere by somebody or by a place that felt different than how I was feeling and then I would feel like that. I would pick up that feeling and I would carry it with me. And it kind of felt like constantly working out other people's emotions. And I think if you're somebody who's on this planet to help people work through emotions, you're actually doing them a disservice maybe to just 
if, if any of the spiritual type stuff is true, like just taking those emotions in and working them through inside of me, that doesn't help them because I'm not talking about how to, how I work through my own emotions or how I've worked through my own trauma. I'm just feeling yo-yoed or catapulted or kind of inside of like a downward swirling whirlpool or something like a spiral and like maybe it's helped me build strength to figure out how to get out of those spirals if they're not mine i have felt much stronger since the last few years so i do feel like michigan has been incredibly restorative as you can probably tell from any of the past youtube videos which who knows why i even make these like this was a weird solution to a strange chapter of my life and now i'm just really transparent and I kind of keep considering stopping doing this and then I keep finding myself doing this. And I think maybe it's just something I'll do it during this transitional chapter or during these strange times. Because I make too many of them to ever edit them. Like I'm not gonna suddenly become so great at editing. I wouldn't even know what to edit out. I don't know what in here is gonna resonate with somebody other than me. Anyway, that's my cue, birds are flying. I'm gonna go see Golden and some other places and Hope you're having a lovely day. Thanks, Boulder, for the songs. Oops. <laughs> Thanks, God, for being bigger than me, bigger than all of us. I learned a song when I was really young. Um, I don't remember where, maybe it was like at a Bible camp or a church camp, or maybe it was on when we went to the Boundary Waters. Oh my gosh, Justin Smith was there too. So he saw me when I became a born again. Hi, Justin. <laughs> so weird. And then I unborned again because I was like, whoa, this makes you really uncool. And I didn't know how to manage that. I didn't know how to hide it at all. So once I felt all those feelings for God and felt this direct connection, then I didn't know how to just like be cool and be chill about it in the world. And so I probably talked about it <laughs> as like a senior or whatever in high school. Was it a senior or a junior? Senior. And like, and then that probably didn't go so well for me socially. And I had already had a really rough life socially. So I think I turned my back on it for that reason and other reasons. I think I had felt guided to leave my boyfriend at that time. Um, his name was Henry. And I could feel I wasn't supposed to be with him. But I didn't like that I was feeling guided away from something that was comfortable and made me feel accepted or loved when I had spent most of my life feeling not accepted and not loved in that boyfriend-girlfriend life, not family. So anyway, we had this song, I think that we sang, like, Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with the wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Ooh, my voice came out. And then there was another one. It was like, um, it was like, Jesus was a cool dude, 40 days without food, gave us the golden rule, and that's the way he's got love on his face. <laughs> Gives us grace, spreading his love all over the place, saying, We will, we will praise him. Woohoo! We will, we will praise him. There you go. Leaving a little bit of God in his face. Who knows if this is a gaudy God space? Probably not. Probably more of an Eastern wisdom and meditation kind of space. But just judging by the cool hippie vibes. But, but that's okay. I'm not going to be influenced anymore. I actually just bought a Tibetan Buddhism book. Buddhism fits perfectly well with uh, Christianity. If you understand the ways that they align. At least for me, you know, you can be open to all things without allowing like demons to possess your body. A lot of Buddhism and Taoism got me in trouble because if I don't have Christianity, then I start believing that all things are equally good just because I'm going to be open to all things and accept and allow all things. I start believing that that means that I have to accept and allow literal demons to like take over my body. If you've never had that happen to you from a darkness in other people, then I'm glad. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I've had it happen to me twice in my life from 
maybe more from things that I could feel other people were bringing into a space. Not feel, they pretty much said outright that they were struggling with certain things and gosh, maybe three, four, whatever. And I had to kind of fight those paths, those things that I felt kind of coming at me. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm like a Care Bear, Mr. Rogers, soul, or wholesome, as this girl called me in Fort Collins. Another person called me wholesome once, uh, Olivia Mainville, <laughs> my friend. Uh, well, back then, we barely knew each other. <laughs> I performed, and then she went right after me, and she's like, well, I don't know if I can follow that. That was so wholesome. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she writes kind of darker stuff, a little more like Halloween-y. Um, or like 40s French jazz, kind of sultry. I don't know. It's really cool, but... So see, that's how I became so confused about how to be myself. Because it's like I looked around at the world and I saw all these people. Libby DeCamp too. Or, oh my gosh, all the like cool indie people who seemed really chill and relaxed and would never do anything like this at Lamplight Music Festival. And like, how do you become yourself when you're surrounded by people that you yourself recognize are cool and interesting. And you can see that socially they're embraced. And it's like... Uh, how do you become a social pariah when you know that that's what your natural self would become? <laughs> I mean, I'm also very, like, I'm usually very loved by people. Like, those specific people often end up loving me. They just don't watch my, all my stuff, but they like that I'm me. I mean, who would watch all my stuff? My own boyfriend or mother or sister don't watch all this stuff. <laughs> like, why would they? I mean, it's just me rambling. So why would you watch this? I don't know. If you get something out of this, maybe you're lonely. Maybe seeing somebody be their authentic self is inspiring for you or uplifting for you. I don't know. It's hard for me to know or understand why I do this. The closest I can get to understanding this from a actual value to other people way is that I've always meant to write books. Like feeling self-help books like Pema Chodron, like Julia Cameron, like Elizabeth Gilbert with Big Magic. I've always wanted to talk to people about how to work through feelings and how to feel a lot and think a lot and evolve and grow, but I'm not organized enough to actually do it in a book. I have hair. I mean, maybe I am, but I don't feel like that's my calling, at least not right now. And so that meant either slate that part of myself and just ignore it, or while I was doing the 365 songs challenge in 365 days, start doing what I called check-in videos, which is what this is. That's where this grew from. So I would do like every 10 songs or so, I would make a check-in video of how it was feeling to write a song every day for a year. And it turned into like a weird way of marking time and marking place. And I loved it. <laughs> so now I do that. All right, Boulder. I'll see you later. Bye.